personal finance PowerPoint presentation. Life insurance overview part number two. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Insurance is part of our long-term risk mitigation strategy where we follow the adage of measure twice, cut once, putting a formal process in place, looking something like set the goal, develop a plan to reach the goal, put the plan in action, review the results, and repeat the process periodically. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia, Life Insurance Guide to Policies and Companies, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This is by Amy Fontanille, updated May. 25th 2022 we're continuing on from a prior presentation and we are continuing on from a prior discussion about insurance in general moving on here to the life insurance noting that life insurance is kind of falls into the category of our classical kinds of insurance like liability insurance and like property insurance where we're safeguarding against some event that may be not likely to happen in the future, hopefully doesn't happen in the future, but if did, would be financially devastating. Therefore, we're insuring against it, such as the home burning down, someone suing us for millions of dollars, or in this case, us dying, which is going to happen. So what are you going to insure against dying? You're going to die, I know, but dying prematurely would be a problem to people that are dependent upon us in a classical condition, such as someone who is whose income is uh, dependent upon by their family. We're continuing on now here. So we're on step number three from the prior presentation. Compare policy quotes. When you've assembled all your necessary information, you can gather multiple life insurance quotes from different providers based on your research. So obviously we would want to be doing some comparing and some contrasting at that point. Prices can differ markedly from company to company, so it's important to take the effort to find the best combination of policy, company rating, and premium cost. So clearly, I think that would be easier to do oftentimes if you're looking at the more simplified, just straight life insurance, which might be the term life insurance. If you're looking at more complex types of life insurance, obviously that will add to the complexity as you're looking at the offers from different uh, companies as well, because the, the variance can change rapidly. So because life insurance is something that you will likely pay monthly for decades, it can save an enormous amount of money to find the best policy to fit your needs. Benefits of life insurance. There are many benefits to having life insurance. Below are some of the most important features and protections offered by life insurance policies. Most people use life insurance to provide money to beneficiaries who would suffer a financial hardship upon the insured's death. So that's the classical case for life insurance. You have a family member, the wage earner of the family possibly, other people uh, taking care of other needs in the family possibly. If the wage earner died, that could be a problem for the other folks. And therefore, because they're dependent on the income, you might wanna have the life insurance to be helping out in that event, hoping it doesn't happen, but be insured against it if it does. However, for wealthy individuals, the tax advantages of life insurance, including the tax deferred growth of cash value, tax-free dividends, and tax-free death benefits can provide additional strategic opportunities. So taxes always provide more complication when you start to when you start to consider these types of tools. So again, are you buying the life insurance in order to actually buy life insurance to do the purpose of what life insurance does? Uh, in general, or are you buying it for some other kind of more complex tax structure? Even if you're buying it for some more complex tax structure, I'd still go by the policy that if I don't understand it, then maybe it's not worth the benefits that I'm, I'm getting from it. I'd like to invest in something that I understand uh, going forward is a general rule that you might want to, you know, kind of keep in mind. So avoiding taxes. The death benefit of a life insurance policy is usually tax-free. Wealthy individuals sometimes buy permanent life insurance within a trust to help pay the estate taxes that will be due upon their death. So if you're a wealthy individual, you could have the estate taxes, which you might call, say, a death tax. So obviously you die, and if you have more than a certain amount of money, the IRS comes in and turns your corpse over and ruffles through your pockets and take you know they take your money right it's a death it's a death tax so then of course you're going to have these strategies that come into place for people to avoid the death taxes obviously the first thing you would think of is like well if i'm on my deathbed then i'll just give all my money on my deathbed to my son or my wife or something or you know some family member uh, at that point in time 
the government has figured that out and, and then they try to stop that from happening at the deathbed and so on and so forth and the game plays out so that whole that whole genre of taxation and planning has a whole lot of of issues with it given of course taxes complicating things greatly so this strategy helps to preserve the value of the estate for their heirs tax avoidance is a law abiding strategy for minimizing one's tax liability and should not be confused with tax evasion which is illegal so if you start doing these kind of things you're saying well you're you're setting up these instruments and, and so on in order to avoid taxes well avoiding taxes if it's illegal to do then uh, then you're legally to do it because you're you're uh, able to pay the least amount of taxes that you're legally required to do whereas if it's evasion that means you're doing something that basically is illegal you might be doing something kind of fraudulent you're taking illegal steps to to stop uh, paying the taxes what's the line between the two sometimes it can be a little bit cloudy on the line between the two because certain tax strategies might not have worked their way through uh the law so they might not be explicitly laid out in the law and, the, and they're being worked out in the courts or something like that so when you get to more complex strategies it could be a little confusing in terms of what's the black and white what's the line in terms of of what's doable or not doable and those are more complex questions that usually come into play for more wealthy individuals so who needs life insurance who needs it then life insurance provides financial support to surviving dependents or other beneficiaries after the death of an insured policyholder here are some examples of people who may need life insurance you got parents with minor children classic kind of case here if a parent dies the loss of their income uh, or caregiving skills could create a financial hardship. So they're dependent on you, they're children, the children dependent. So life insurance can make sure the kids will have a financial resource they need until they can support themselves. Parents with special needs, uh, adult children. So for children who require lifelong care and will never be self-sufficient, life insurance can make sure their needs will be met after their parents pass away. So hopefully, of course, the children would grow up and be self-supporting at some point in time. Certain people aren't going to be self-supporting in that way, and you might need life insurance would be a tool or strategy to help them in the event that hopefully they're still going to live longer than you, but you won't have the same uh, kind of support for your whole life for them. The death benefit can be used to fund a special needs trust that a, fidu a fiduciary will manage for the adult child's benefit. Adults uh, who own property together married or not if the death of one adult would mean that the other could no longer afford loan payments upkeep and taxes on the property life insurance might be a good idea for example for uh, one example would be an engaged couple who take out a joint mortgage to buy their first house so now you've got two people you know uh, purchasing on uh, the home which might be more dependent on say one person's kind of salary and so on so seniors who want to leave money to adult children who provide their care. Many adult children sacrifice time at work to care for an elderly parent who needs help. This help may also include direct financial support. Life insurance can help reimburse the adult child's costs when the parent passes away. So young adults whose parents incurred private student loan debt or consigned a loan for them. Young adults without dependents rarely need life insurance, but if a parent will be on the hook for a child's debt after their death, the child may want to carry enough life insurance to pay off that debt. Children or young adults who want to lock in low rates, this is probably the more common kind of scenario, the younger and healthier you are, the lower your insurance premiums. And that just kind of makes sense, of course. So if you're a, a younger individual, and you're going to be paying into the insurance for a longer period of time you might be able to lock in you might be able to pay you know lower premiums because you're going to be paying it in for a longer period of time and statistically speaking you would think it's less likely that you're going to be dying so that would be a good benefit a good deal to the insurance company so a 20 something adult might buy a policy even without having dependents if there is an expectation to have them in the future so in other words if you're saying I can buy insurance now, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm not married and so on, but I think I might get married in the future, who knows, or, or I might I might want to mitigate against my risk of getting married or something like that or something, or, you know, so you buy the insurance now where it could be cheaper at that point in time 
and then you might be lined up even if you don't have anybody dependent upon you at that time. So stay at home spouses, stay at home spouses uh, should have life insurance as they have significant economic value based on the work they do in the home. According to salary.com, the economic value of stay at home parent uh, would have been equivalent to an annual salary of $162,581 in 2018. That's quite specific amount of home care costs. That's a lot more than I make. Man, in any case, wealthy families who expect to owe est estate taxes. Life insurance can provide funds to cover the taxes and keep the full value of the estate intact. So you got estate planning. Families who can't afford burial and funeral expenses. So a small life insurance policy can provide fun funds to honor a loved one's passing, which can be nice because of course, you know, you don't want to, if you die and you're like, okay, now that now the people that are taking care of this don't have the funds obviously to pay for the funeral costs, which can be quite expensive and you get, and you get the, kind of like that scene that you had in the big Lebowski or whatever, where he's like, I, I would like your most modestly priced receptacle and he ends up putting the ashes in a coffee can and stuff like, you don't want that kind of stuff to happen. So you could have the life insurance in that case. So then we got the business with a key employees. Now you got the business side of things. If the death of a key employee, such as the CEO would create a severe financial hardship for a firm, that firm may have an insurable interest that will allow it to purchase a life insurance policy on that employee. So now you got a CEO, CEO, possibly they're like the, the face of the company or something like that. If they die, could be a problem to the company, you might then have an insurable interest there. So buried uh, pens pensioners, instead of choosing between a pension payout uh, that offers a spousal benefit and one that doesn't, pensioners can choose to accept their full pension and use some of the money to buy life insurance to benefit their spouse. This strategy is called pension maximization. Those with pre-existing conditions such as cancer, diabetes, or smoking. Sm smoking is a pre-existing condition now. I thought it was just, uh, anyways, I, I'm not up to date on that. So in any case, note, however, that some insurers may deny coverage for such individuals or else change or charge very high rates. Research policy options and company reviews. Because life insurance policies are a major expense and commitment, it's critical to do proper due diligence to make sure the company you choose has a solid track record and financial strength, given that your heirs may not receive any death benefits for many decades into the future. Investopedia has evaluated scores of companies that offer all different types of insurance rated uh, the best in numerous categories. So we might look a little bit about the insurance companies kind of uh, in the future, just so you can get a, a launching point and start your research from there. Life insurance can be a prudent financial tool to hedge your bets and provide protection for your loved ones in case of death should you die while the policy is in force. However, there are situations in which it makes less sense, such as buying too much or uh, insuring those whose income doesn't need to be replaced. So it's important to consider the following. What expenses couldn't be met if you died? So if you died, you know, who's kind of dependent on you? What kind of needs need to be met at that point that's possibly being taken care of by uh, your income? And do you have other assets that might be able to kind of hedge that? So if your spouse has a high income and you don't have any children, maybe it's not warranted. It is still essential to consider the impact of your uh, potential death on a spouse and consider how much financial support they would need uh, to grieve without worrying about returning to work before they're ready. So uh, even in that situation, if you don't have any dependents or something like that, it might be nice to have enough life insurance to take care of the funeral costs and, and whatever needs to happen for the grieving process and whatever. However, if both spouses' income is necessary to maintain a desired lifestyle or meet financial commitments, then both spouses may need separate life insurance coverage. Oftentimes these days, you got two working people that are dependent on their current income to meet their current lifestyle. And in which case, if one of them died prematurely, could uh, hamper the other person's you know, lifestyle, obviously. So if you're buying a policy on another family member's life, it's important to ask, what are you trying to insure? Children and seniors 
really don't have any uh, meaningful income to replace, but burial expenses may need to be covered in the event of their death. When you talk to like insurance, people that sell life insurance and stuff like that, they might try to sell you life insurance, you know, for everybody that everybody, right? Everybody needs a life insurance. But obviously, if you're talking about children or seniors that don't have any income, no one's really dependent upon them, then you got to think about, well, why, you know, do they need the life insurance? Do I need the life insurance just in the event that they died so that I can cover expensive funeral costs? Possibly can I self-insure? against something like that for children are we insuring really early so that we can get a really cheap policy for a long time that they can then carry when they do have people that are dependent upon them is that the strategy you know what's the rationale uh there so beyond burial expenses a parent may also want to protect their child's future insurability by purchasing a moderate size policy when they are young so that's the strategy for younger people you're saying okay well, maybe they don't have anybody dependent upon them at this time, but if they get the policy now, it's going to be really cheap. You can, maybe you can lock in a, a really cheap you know, rate at that point because you're going to be paying into it for a longer time. So doing so allows that parent to ensure that their child can financially protect their future family. So then if you lock in that lower rate, then then maybe they're allowed to go start smoking and stuff and they don't get, you know, because you already locked it in. So now they can... They won't get pen. I don't know. You don't want to. Do That's not a good reason to start smoking just because you're locked into your insurance. But, you know, you might that might be a strategy. Parents are only allowed to purchase life insurance for their children up to 25 percent of the in force policy on their own lives. Could investing the money that would be paid in premiums for permanent insurance throughout a policy earn a better return over time? So in other words, if you have permanent policies, uh, and you've got this kind of investment component to it, would it be worth more to basically invest it somewhere else? Would you earn more on it? So as a hedge against uncertainty, consistent saving and investing, for example, self-insuring might make more sense in some cases if a significant income doesn't need to be replaced or if policy investment returns on cash value are overly conservative. How life insurance work? Uh, a life insurance policy has two main components, a death benefit and a premium. Fairly straightforward when you get down to the basics of it. You got the premium, you got the death benefit. Term life, uh, term life insurance has these two components, but permanent or whole life insurance policies also have a cash value component. So clearly, again, the term life insurance is just classical insurance. Pretty, pretty basic to understand. Why are you buying it? Because I'm trying to insure against my dying and the impact it might have on someone that could or may in the future be dependent upon me at this point in time the term gets a little bit more confusing so one we've got the death benefit the uh, death benefit or face value is the amount of money the insurance company guarantees the beneficiaries identified in the policy when the insured dies the insured might be a parent and the beneficiaries might be their children. For example, the insured will choose the desired death benefit amount based on the beneficiary's estimated future needs. The insurance company will determine whether there is an insurable interest and if the pro proposed insured qualifies for the coverage based on the company's underwriting requirements related to age, health, and any hazardous activities in which the proposed insured participates to. The premium. Premiums are the money the policyholder pays for insurance. The insurer must pay the death benefit when the insured dies if the policyholder pays the premium as required and premiums are determined in part by how likely it is that the insurer will have to pay the policy's death benefit based on the insured's life expectancy. So obviously you're going to have to pay the premium. When you pay the premium, that will require the insurance company possibly to pay out to the beneficiary in the event that you die within the term. For example, the calculation of the premium will be dependent in part on their actuarial calculation as they put your numbers into the whole group of numbers. And it could be dependent in part on your particular risk factors, including the smoking thing. Factors that influence life expectancy, including the insured's age, gender, medical history, occupational hazard, and high-risk hobbies. Part of the premium also goes towards the insurance company's operating expenses. Premiums are higher on policies with larger death benefits, clearly. Individuals who are at high risk, clearly. 
and permanent policies that accumulate cash value. Clearly, right? Because all those things, one, the premiums are going to be higher uh, if you have larger death benefits, meaning if I die, I want you to be paying out millions to these people. Well, that's going to that's going to cost more on the premium side of things. Individuals who have high risk. So if you're smoking on railroad tracks as you sleep, you know, and with the lighter still open because you like to light your cigarettes with, you know, a bonfire on the railroad track, you know, that kind of thing. Well, then that's going to increase your risk, you would think. And the permanent policies that accumulate cash value because that's kind of like an investment as well so you're kind of combining two things together so you would think the, the premiums would be higher for for them number three cash value so this is for the for the non-term so the cash value or permanent life insurance serves two purposes it is a savings account that the policyholder can use during the life of the insured. The cash accumulates on a tax deferred basis. So there we got that tax component, which is just going to confuse the whole thing. So some policies may have restrictions on withdrawals, depending on how the money is to be used. For example, the policyholder might take out a loan against the policy's cash value and have to pay interest on the loan principal. So you can kind of use it as, as a safeguard in a few different ways. If you have this cash value in there, uh, then you might say, well, I can't if I can't take the money out, maybe maybe I can take a loan and I can use the cash value as basically collateral on the loan, which could be another way to kind of, you know, have available money possibly in the event that you really needed it. The policyholder can also use the cash value to pay premiums or purchase additional insurance. So you can also you can you can use it to buy more insurance. The insurance company gives that you know option to you. The cash value is a living benefit that remains with the insurance company when the insured dies. Any outstanding loans against the cash value will reduce the policy's death benefit. Life insurance riders and policy changes. Many insurance companies offer policyholders the options to customize their policies to accommodate their needs. Riders are the most common way policyholders may modify or change their poli their plans. There are many riders, but uh, but availability depends on the provider. The policyholder will typically pay an individual premium for each rider or a fee to exercise the rider, though some policies include certain riders in their base premium. So the additional death benefit rider provides additional life insurance coverage in the event the insured's death is uh, accidental. So if you accidental death, the waiver of premium rider relieves the policyholder from making premium payments if the insured becomes disabled and unable to work. The disability income rider pays a monthly income in the event the policyholder becomes unable to work for several months or longer due to a series of illness, a serious illness or injury. Upon diagnosis of terminal illness, the accelerated death benefit rider allows the insured to collect a portion or all of the death benefit. The long-term care rider is a type of accelerated death benefit that can be used to pay for nursing home, assisted living, or in-home care when the insured requires help with activities of daily living such as bathing, eating, and using the toilet. The guaranteed insurability rider lets the policyholder buy additional insurance at a later date without a medical review.